Welcome YouTube listeners and viewers rather. My name is Michael Williams and I have a very interesting story for you today. And before I get into it though, just to let you guys know, this is my first YouTube video. So I just want you guys to please be patient with me if you see any faux pas or any lapses in my story or anything. Just be patient and bear with me, please. Um, if anybody is interested, please feel free to follow me on Instagram at realtalk006 or microphone mic spelled Mike, M-I-K-E, microphone Mike, M-I-K-E on Facebook. So today my story is about a no good deadbeat father. <laughs> I know we hear those stories all the time, but this one is depicting my father who he essentially abandoned my siblings and I after my mother died of cancer. So a very horrific story, as you can imagine, as it sounds. So I'll start at the beginning, like basically my earliest memories. So as far as like my family dynamic is concerned, I have two brothers and two sisters. I am the last born, the baby of the family. My mother name was Brenda Sue Williams and my father is James Earl Holt. We are from Mississippi and a town called, well, a group of cities called the Mississippi Delta. You may or may not have heard of it, but it's in Mississippi. It's basically just a group of about maybe six or seven towns in Mississippi that are very poverty stricken. In my opinion, it was like a good place to grow up. So very early on, from the earliest things that I can remember, my father was very abusive, physically abusive to my mother, verbally abusive to my mother. And he was also a cheater as well. He was a cheater. We would find notes in his car. Once again, it was like a small town. So word always got around when people were doing stuff they weren't supposed to do because of, you know, how small towns are. So he was just a very abusive person. And my mother around like 1992 or sometime in 1991, perhaps I can remember coming home from school and my mother, uh, my mother just telling us basically, y'all, I have cancer. That's exactly what she said. And at the time, you know, I was so young, maybe like eight or nine years old. I didn't know what cancer was and I didn't know what it meant. You know, so I can remember after that, her going to buy um, a bag like luggage or whatever, I guess because she was going to be doing a hospital stay. So I can remember her being at the hospital for a few weeks. And then I think she even had a surgery in that time. And when she actually came home from the hospital, my naive childish mind, I thought that that was the end of it. And I thought it was all over. And I thought that we were going to just go back to life, basically back to like basically like a normal life. And no, of course not. That was not the case. So my mother was given, I believe, a year to live, but she actually lived about a year and six months. But she ended up dying of cancer in November 8th of 1993. So... And during the time my mother had cancer, my father was still very verbally abusive to my mother. I don't know if he was physically abusive, but I, from what I've heard, I believe he was very, still very physically abusive to my mother and verbally abusive during the duration of her cancer. So she passed away from cancer November 8, 1993. So at this point, my father was still in the picture. Um... So around like 1995, my sister and I, we, my two sisters and I, we were the youngest of all five children. So we were kind of the ones that were more close together because my oldest brother was just basically maybe about 18 years old at this time. So he was out just trying to figure out life on his own as an adult. And my two sisters and I were basically by ourselves. So some type of way it was noticed that we were not getting the adequate care that we 
should have been getting. So we were being shuffled around from different relatives house to other relatives house and still not getting the care that we needed. Like no clean clothes, no body making sure we got enrolled in school and just the things that children need. So we were taken into the custody of the state of Mississippi. My two sisters were sent to live in a foster home. So in the foster home, they got the good care that they needed, but I don't think the lady that they were placed with was a good person, but they definitely started getting the care that they needed. But as far as me, I was placed with a family member and I still did not get the care that I needed. There was still no clean clothes, no proper food, no regular food, just a plethora of just problems. And I stayed with that relative for about three years. I mean, it was a horrible situation. So much so, like I started keeping a journal of everything that was going on during the time when I stayed there, like no food, no cleaning supplies, no toiletries. And I, I kept the journal. One day, one of my classmates looked into my book bag and they actually read my journal that I was keeping. And I really kind of like had to play it off like, oh, y'all not doing that in your class? That's how like bad the, the details were in the journal. And even at one point in that relative's house, they did not have running water, no running water. And this was back in the 1990s. So it was really just a frustrating living environment to stay there. And I was actually there like three years. I still say that that is the worst three years that I've ever spent of my life. That is the worst three years ever to this day. So how I got out of that situation, I was in the eighth grade, I believe. And I simply, one day it was just, we just had a big blow up and I just simply refused to stay there anymore. I could not do it anymore. It was horrible. Three long years and I just refused to not go. So that at that point, that is when um, the state of Mississippi placed me with my brother. But let me go back in reverse a little bit. So my father, the last time I can remember seeing my father was in 1997. Maybe I was like 12 or 13 at that point. I saw him on like Christmas Eve and I think he brought me a Christmas gift. But before that, he had been going in and out of town, in and out of town. Each time his trips in and out of town would be longer and longer until that final time that I saw him in 1997 on Christmas Eve. Now, I have not personally seen my father since 1997 but my sister saw him one time in 2011 when my grandfather, his father, passed away. He basically abandoned his, he, he abandoned four children, well, five children, excuse me, without a mother. I, I just, as a, as a man, I don't think I could ever do that, you know. And in the subsequent years of him re-emerging, he always comes back with drama and problems. Recently, my sister found a video. No, my sister found pictures of someone that looked, a guy that looked exactly like my brother and I, almost like a spitting image of us. And he was on my father's Facebook page. And the guy is the same age as me. We have the same first name. And so I messaged the person to ask him, you know, who his parents were and did he have any ties to Mississippi? He said he did, but other than that, he wouldn't tell me any more information. So he was being very elusive. So I'm adding this part in there. Remember earlier in my story when I told you my father was actually a habitual cheater? So... I'm assuming that that gentleman that I spoke with was one of my father's children. And he also blocked me, by the way. I guess I was asking one too many questions for his liking. But I don't know. Like, I don't um, really resent my father or anything like that. I talked to him. The, the last time I actually talked to him on the phone was 
May 2013. So we talked on the phone for, for at least three or four hours. He told me, he gave me his explanation of what of what took place, you know, back around the time when my mother passed away. And he was basically saying like he had been with my mother basically since he was 17 or 18 years old and just living without her was too painful. Now, back in 2013, I could kind of understand where he was coming from. And there was still like a little room at that point where I felt like we could uh like maybe build on and possibly repair the relationship. So after that phone call, this was back in 2013, mind you, it is 2021 now. He was like, well, I'll give you a call back in a few days. So never heard from him since May of 2021. So a few days has now turned into almost a decade and another year or two. So I don't know. He still resurfaces every now and then, but whenever he resurfaces, um, he comes back with drama. So I'm no longer interested. I'm no longer open to a relationship because at this point I feel like he has been out of my life actually longer than he's been in my life. So I'm not mad. I don't feel any malice towards him. I don't want anything bad to happen to him. I don't know. I'm just, there's, there's no chance for a relationship here because I feel like it's gone on too long and it's gone too far. And I know that somebody can relate to this story. I know there are people out there who have a similar experience. I want this video to get to as many people as possible because I know people can relate to this and this story is not just exclusive to me. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up now. But once again, please feel free to contact me um, and follow me on Instagram, Realtalk006 and Facebook, Microphone Mike, spelled M-I-K-E. It's been a pleasure telling this story to you guys, and I really hope it helps someone. Thank you so much. Take care.